Tonight's NFL matchup is seen as a potential comeback moment for the 1-3 and three Atlanta Falcons as they take on the 2-2 two and two New York Jets, but PBS's front line will be paying special attention to the game looking for concussions. They have a 2013 Concussion Watch website, 36 so far this season. It's all part of their latest project, what they call the NFL's Concussion Crisis. It's a two-hour special report they did with brothers and ESPN investigative reporters Steve Fanaru and Mark Fanaruwada, but one unwilling partner, according to the brothers and front line, was the NFL. Take a look. The NFL would not cooperate with the Fainaru brothers, nor would it talk to Frontline. We went to New York to meet with them and say, look, this is what we're doing. We'd like you to participate. We'd like you to make available these various people. And the NFL's message was, sorry, we're not going to help you. Steve Fainaru and Mark Fainaruwada join me now from New York to talk about the documentary, which premieres tomorrow night on PBS Frontline, and their book, League of Denial, the NFL Concussions and the Battle for Truth. It hits bookstores tomorrow. Uh, it's a great book. Uh, congratulations to both of you. Uh, gentlemen, as, uh, I'll start with you, Steve. As we played in your introduction, you say the NFL did not cooperate in your investigation. Uh, I can understand why, given that they're not exactly painted as uh, behaving heroically uh, when it comes to acknowledging uh, the damage that football can cause to the human brain. Did the NFL purposefully throw up roadblocks to your reporting? No, I wouldn't, th I wouldn't say they did. I mean, the roadblocks that they, that they threw up were basically not making anybody from the NFL available to us. I mean, we, went, we traveled to New York to meet with them, as Mark mentions in the film. Uh, we told them what we were doing, but really because we wanted to be transparent and, in and inclusive and and let them know what we were doing, and they politely declined, and then they declined every subsequent request that we, we made along the way while trying to report this, this book and this film. It's really too bad. Uh, Mark, you tell a lot of tragic stories in this book, but obviously the most vivid one is the one of Pittsburgh Steelers center uh, Mike Webster. Uh, tell our viewers what, what happened uh, to Webster, and why was studying his brain such a pivotal moment uh, to the to the this issue of the realization nationally of this issue of brain damage and football. Well, Webster really is sort of patient zero, and we lay out his story extensively in the book and in the film. He's he's a heroic figure in Pittsburgh, the center for four Super Bowl uh, championship teams as the dynasty of the Steelers builds, and they called him Iron Mike because he was such a rock, um, playing in many consecutive games. But upon his retirement, he effectively went mad, and and Mike began to realize as he was losing his mind over that time that he. He believed that football was what had caused his brain damage. And in fact, he even eventually had five doctors who agreed with him. Um, but it's not until he dies um, and he ends up on an autopsy table and a young junior pathologist named Bennett Amalu examined Mike's brain and then discovers he has this neurological neurodegenerative disease, CTE, the first in a football player. And that is really the launching point for the concussion crisis in the NFL. Of course, the NFL is putting out the opposite information at the time you you write in your book and this moment in the book really made me so mad but in the in the early 2000s the NFL the rolling out numerous scientific studies and they're all getting printed in this medical journal the head of the NFL's mild traumatic brain injury committee this this uh, physician named Elliot Peltman uh, who wrote in this journal neurosurgery that um, regarding brain injuries quote this injury has not been observed in professional football how could Peltman write that and how could that medical journal publish it? Well, I, th I think what's so striking is that you have parallel narratives going on at the time. You have, on the one hand, a growing body of as many as a dozen neuroscientists, many of whom were affiliated with the NFL or loved professional football, who were trying to warn the league that this was a growing problem. While at the same time, you had the NFL's own research arm denying that, in fact, it could possibly be true and putting out papers that were essentially saying that, that NFL players were superhuman, that they were impervious to brain damage. And of course, the editor-in-chief of the journal who, that published those papers was himself a neurological consultant of the New York Giants. And so there was this dynamic going on where everyone around the league who was involved in this research was affiliated with the league and was associated with this systematic effort to basically deny that this was a, a real thing. I need to read this response to your reporting by the NFL. We obviously reached out for comment. The NFL Senior VP of Health and Safety Policy sent this statement. I'm going to read part of it. Quote, for more than two decades, the NFL has been a leader in addressing the issue of head injuries in a serious way. Important steps 
have included major investments in independent medical research, improved medical protocols and benefits, innovative partnerships with the CDC, NIHG, and others to accelerate uh, progress. The NFL just this year reached a $765 million concussion settlement that would provide money for medical exams, concussion-related compensation for NFL retirees, their families, et cetera, $10 million toward medical research. But you say you found some caveats with that. Steve? Well, this is Mark. The, the, you know, among the things are Mike Webster, who's patient zero, as we talked about in this, um, he, he's not eligible in this. Nobody who, who died uh, during that period of time and, and prior to, I believe it's 2006, is eligible um, as well, there's a real question about whether there's enough money um, to go around in the settlement. There's some serious questions. There's, you know, we found over 300 players at this point have qualified for, for monies based on neurologic, neurocognitive issues. And there's some real questions of whether that $765 million in the end are going to be enough for all these players who are suffering. All right, Steve Fanaru and Mark Fanaru Wada, thank you so much. A really powerful book. The Frontline Special airs tomorrow night at 9 p.m. on PBS. Thank